Ever get to the end of a USMLE style question and two answers seem reasonable? Time is ticking while you switch between the two, doubting yourself, and then ultimately choose the wrong one? But then when you look at the explanation, do you ever realize that your first answer was correct? I'm Alec Pomerantian, and I'm going to show you the five most common issues that I and others have had to overcome to solve this and immediately improve our USMLE scores, some to the 260s or even 270s. Plus, I'll tell you about a student who called me crying convinced he'd failed step two only to score something he hadn't imagined possible. Let's dive in. The first issue is what I call the judge versus lawyer problem. The real issue here is that oftentimes when we're stuck between two answer choices, we're not actually stuck between two answer choices. I know that sounds weird, but let me explain. Oftentimes when people have two answers remaining, what they're actually doing is that they're looking at one of the answers more carefully than the other. Oftentimes, people that have good knowledge of a subject will read a question and maybe 80% of it's gonna fit. But there's one thing that doesn't quite fit. And because that one thing doesn't fit, they don't feel confident in putting that as their answer. Their perfectionism leads to a form of overthinking. And so what they end up doing is, is they, they'll, they'll look at that answer and they'll say, eh, I don't know, I think that maybe that's not the right answer. And then they'll eliminate it. And then they'll choose the other one basically by default. The issue here is that they are essentially being a lawyer, right? Where they're having different standards of evidence for the different answers. As an example, there was one student that I worked with who she wanted to go into pediatrics, so she had a really good knowledge of pediatric conditions. The question that she was looking at was a pretty classic Kleinfelter patient. Now, one thing didn't match perfectly. Like, the patient wasn't tall. So she was like, well, I don't know. Kleinfelter patients typically are tall. And so she went back and forth but said, ultimately, mm, this doesn't quite feel right, and so eliminated it, and then chose the other answer that was remaining basically by default. What goes wrong in this situation and many situations where we see people stuck between two answer choices is that we apply harsh scrutiny to our first choice, but we have much less scrutiny for the second. In other words, we're the lawyer where we're constantly trying to poke holes in the argument of the, the one that we want to choose, but we'll do anything to basically justify in our minds why the other answer would be correct. Now, the solution to this is to be the judge rather than the lawyer. Whereas the judge is going to pick apart only one answer looking for any possible flaw and demanding perfection from that. The, the judge is going to look at the answers side by side and compare them. None of these answers is perfect, but which answer makes more sense? The judge accepts that there's going to be some uncertainty behind this because, especially for shelf exams in step two, which we'll talk about later, questions are not going to give you every single classical sign or symptom, and so there's going to be some degree of what we call noise in the question. The second issue that causes people to get stuck between two answer choices is that they miss the forest through the trees. I just had a consultation with a student who failed step one, unfortunately. When she was studying for step one, she had sort of approached it as if she was supposed to memorize everything as random details, but in retrospect, now that she's taken step one and failed, and now that she's done shelf exams, she realizes that what they were really testing her on was concepts. As we've talked about in other videos, this is exactly what the NBME, who writes step one and step two, is doing when they're writing questions, is they're testing you on the application of fundamental principles. One of the biggest reasons why people will get stuck between two answer choices is because they, they get stuck in this mentality of thinking that, that the question is asking them some random detail that they were supposed to memorize. For example, there was a student that I was working with where the, the patient in the vignette had a massive PE. It was just really obvious that they had a pulmonary embolism and they had like unilateral swelling, they had kind of the classic Virchow's triad, everything fit with a pulmonary embolism. That wasn't the challenge. But what the student found challenging was that the question asked something like, what would you see on an echocardiogram in this patient? Now, this student, mind you, was a second year medical student. They had no idea how to read an echocardiogram. This was not something that they had studied. And so they immediately started to panic. If you ever find yourself in this position where you think, oh my gosh, how could I possibly know this knowledge. Like, how could someone expect me at my level to actually know this? You're probably missing the point, just like this student. In this case, they weren't seeing the concept. And the concept here was really just about preload, afterload, and contractility. Specifically, that a pulmonary embolism, because it's blocking the artery, is increasing the afterload massively. The solution to this problem is to rephrase the question. So instead of it being something detailed, like what would you see in a massive pulmonary embolism in this patient, instead ask yourself, if you had a massive increase in afterload for the right heart, what would you see? In one case, you're 
there's a lot of unnecessary details about echocardiogram and about, you know, like a massive pulmonary embolism. On the other hand, you're really just seeing what do they represent, right? An echocardiogram is just a way of looking at the heart. The pulmonary embolism just represents afterload. So the next time you ask yourself, how could I possibly know this? And you're stuck between two or even three answers, take a step back and ask yourself, what concept do I think they're really asking me about and try to simplify it. The next issue that can cause people to get stuck between two answer choices and choose the wrong one is the difference between recognition versus true understanding. This is especially common for people that may be struggling with scores that are sort of at or below the passing line. The issue is what they call the Dunning-Kruger effect, a period of time where we're overconfident in our learning it's known as the Dunning-Kruger effect, where initially, when we know less about something, paradoxically, our confidence is near its highest. And this can get in our way. For example, when I was first learning how to cook, I would watch these shows about cooking, and I learned some like sort of basic principles. And I thought to myself, wow, that seems really easy. I can do that. And I immediately got the ingredients and tried to make the recipe, and it was a complete an utter disaster. I think I made the recipe two or three times trying like different things and two or three times I ended up throwing it away. The same thing is true when I'm getting questions wrong and I'm getting stuck between two answer choices. Sometimes I have to ask myself, do I really understand this concept? Can I recognize it? Am I familiar with it? Have I heard about afterload, but I, do I really understand it? If I'm ever in doubt about whether I understand something deeply enough, like if I ask my, have to ask myself that question, then oftentimes that's a sign that I could probably deal with learning this better and understanding it more conceptually. Since step one and step two and shelf exams are all about applying fundamental concepts, it is almost never a bad idea to learn things at a more fundamental or conceptual level. A fourth issue that's related to depth of understanding for why people will get stuck between two answer choices is the retention problem. A common pattern that we see is that people are just overwhelmed with the huge volume of knowledge. They estimate that medical knowledge doubles roughly every 73 days, which means that the amount of things that you need to know now for your step one or step two or shelf exam is much more than was necessary 10 or 20 years ago. Because there's so much material, people have a tendency of rushing to try to cover more and more content. This is worsened by any sort of guilt that people may feel about, oh, man, I wish that I had done this earlier. The issue that arises is that they're so focused on learning new material, they're not doing enough to retain old things that they've learned. And so they're constantly learning things while they're forgetting the last thing that they studied. And so their knowledge tends to plateau at a pretty low level. This can show up as getting stuck between two answer choices on a question because your knowledge may not be where it was. Before I discovered space repetition, I had studied molecular biology at Stanford. I had done pretty well on the test and I had felt like, yeah, I know this really really well because i hadn't made cards because i hadn't used space repetition i hadn't had a system for remembering it by the time that i was doing questions on it when i was in my dedicated studying for step one i was really struggling with it i remember having known in the past but because i wasn't actively trying to remember it i was just forgetting it the solution to this is in addition to like once you've learned something well you want to make sure that you have a system where you never ever ever forget it if you want tips for this be sure to check out our other videos on how to use anki effectively the thing that i want you to remember with this is if you can just make sure that once you learn something you learn it well and you use spaced repetition so that you never ever forget it, so many things will change for you, including getting more questions correct on your tests. The final issue that causes people to get stuck between two answer choices and choose the wrong one is that they don't understand the rules of the game. I think to understand this, it's, it's worthwhile to talk about the concepts of signal versus noise. In education, signal is there to basically lead you to the correct answer. The signal would be something like, they have chest pain, it radiates to their left shoulder, you have ST elevations on an EKG. Noise would be anything that doesn't lead you to the correct interpretation, including things that might be distracting to you. For a patient that has an MI, that might be something like, oh, they have GERD or gastroesophageal reflux. That's noise because it is another thing that could give you chest pain, but it's not like it has really nothing to do with their underlying pathophysiology. Other sources of noise might be something that's just like completely unrelated. Like, you know, their mother had mitral stenosis when she was 65, right? Like something that's completely unrelated. One of the unwritten rules of step one versus step two is, is that step one has a lot more signal and a lot less noise. Meaning that in a patient with an MI, they're going to give you a lot more of the classic elements and they're going to minimize the amount of things that, that might confuse you. 
For step two, however, they're going to make the signal less strong. So for a class, for an MI, they're probably not going to give you a classic presentation. They're not going to give you an EKG showing classic ST elevations. It might be a patient that is a non-classic presentation, like an older woman that has sort of like upper abdominal pain. The way that this leads people to get stuck between two answer choices is that if you're trying to make sense of every sentence as you're reading it, which you should, if you don't recognize that some of the things that they're telling you are there to try to confuse you, then you might get stuck and say like, well, I can't really explain this, leading you to doubt the correct answer. This has much more to do with your expectations than the actual questions themselves. Let me give an example to illustrate how different it feels to do well on one of these tests versus how it feels to do well on another one of the tests. As I mentioned in the beginning, I had a student who called me crying after he took step two and he was so devastated. He was actually worried that he had failed his test. He had failed step one, but in less than two months had basically transformed his approach and had gone from the bottom 3% to the top 3%. His NBME score was like a 262 by the time that he retook his test, less than two months after he, we started working together. He knew this really, really well. His shelf exams before he went in were in like the high 80s and low 90s. Some of his NBMEs when he was studying for step two were in the 260s or even 270s. So he knew this really, really well. His fear after he walked out of his test was, oh my gosh, I think I just failed this test. What am I going to do? Lest you think that this is just a one-off experience, this is actually pretty common, especially for step two. His ultimate score was almost identical to his step one score. For step one, he walked out saying, I think I nailed that test. Like, unless there was something that went horribly wrong, I did really, really well. For step two, however, you know, virtually the same score, but he walked out crying. The difference is that for step two, because the signal is weaker and the noise is stronger, they're doing more to try to confuse you. It's going to feel less certain when you choose your answer, even if it's the correct answer. When people get stuck between two answer choices and that doubt is growing, it's because they don't have the right expectations. They don't understand that this is a feature, not a bug. They should expect to have some degree of uncertainty because that's the way that the test is written, which in fairness is basically what real clinical experience is like. So if you're stuck between two answer choices and choosing the wrong one, remember these five points. One, be the judge, not the lawyer. Second, find the core concept behind what it is they're asking you. Three, Build a true understanding of the concepts, don't just memorize the details. Four, create a system of retention. And five, understand the rules of the game. And if you want to learn how to improve your score at any level, check out this video, how to score USMLE 260+, even if you're failing.